Hey, I'm Ray, and welcome to God Talk Global Internet Fellowship. Tonight, we're headed into the courtroom to take a look at a trial that's been going on since the beginning of time. And who's on trial? Truth. And the king has been called to be the expert witness. Remember, if you find value in this video series, hit the old subscribe button and ring the bell. That way you'll get a new notification every time I post a video or a song. First, I'd like to play you a new song I wrote not that long ago. It has to do with the subject matter of tonight and it's called, Who's Gonna Save Us Now? Right after this. Sets like the sun behind the clouds of deception in the sky. And the shadows that once mocked our separation now blend into the light. The people sing the praises. To a God made out of virtual gold As love grows cold And the playwright finds himself unemployed For the theater's been sold Prime ministers and presidents leave the party early in the night To get back to their hotel rooms and get ready for an early morning flight But as they sleep the dawn is stolen, rolled up like a painting and hidden away Never again will the sun rise in a land where her freedom is betrayed Lay your head up on my shoulder Lay your head Upon my shoulder Lay your hand Let's see who saves us now Justice has no meaning When the verdict can be bought the price and morality's but a sugar flavored cocktail with dark rum and crushed ice our children sing and dance to music we no longer understand us who penned the lyrics, patented all the titles, and hired the band. Lay your head upon my shoulder, lay your head upon my shoulder, lay your head, let's see who saves. 
Have you ever had this happen to you while you've been stopped at a stoplight? First, you start to fiddle with something in your car. Maybe you're trying to take a drink of your coffee or change the station, hopefully not texting. And then the vehicle on your left and the vehicle on your right starts to inch forward at the exact same time, very slowly. It freaks you out, right? You start to panic as you think you're moving backward. You stomp on the brake, grab the steering wheel with both hands and try to find something stationary so you can get your bearings. Well, that's exactly like life. We can philosophically put truth into a few different categories, but for the purpose of simplicity tonight, we're only going to talk about two, absolute truth and relative truth. And what's the difference? Well, absolute truth is foundational, never changing. It is what it is. It's the truth Miyamoto Musashi, one of the greatest samurai ever to live, referred to when he said, truth is what it is. You either bend to its power or you live a lie. Now, on the other hand, we have relative truth, and that's entirely different. Relative truth is based on what is personally true. In other words, what is true to you may differ from others. Relative truth is more of an opinion. Now, here's some examples. Chocolate ice cream tastes better than strawberry ice cream. Math is boring. Learning how to operate a computer is really easy. That dress looks nice on you. Now, you wouldn't want to share with that woman that this was only an example of relative truth. You might find an absolute steel frying pan headed for your head. Anyway, I think you get my point. The fact is, over here in the West, we spend more of our day-to-day -day lives living in relative truth. What are we going to have for supper? What are we going to wear? What did you think of this song or that movie? Is the government doing a good or bad job? On social media today, most of the posts are consisting of relative truth, and some people are ready to go to war if others disagree with them. Well, in as much as we love our relative truth, we can't base our lives around it. When life starts to go haywire, we look for something that is unmovable so we can get our bearings. In other words, when things matter most, we always want absolute truth. When it comes to our health, financial investments, or relationships, we don't want opinions. We want good, old-fashioned, solid, foundational, capital T, truth. Now imagine going to the doctor and he says to you, I think you have something that is terminal, but, you know, it could be just a cold. Would you be satisfied with that answer? No, you'd demand tests so that you knew exactly what you were up against. When Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he's not speaking in relative truth. He's speaking in absolute foundational truth. If he was speaking in relative truth, then him calling himself the way and the life would also be relative, only his opinion. But he solidifies the absoluteness of that statement by the next line. No one comes to the Father except by me. He is the way. He is the truth. And he is life itself. The Almighty, the All-Knowing, and the Eternal. Let's have a look at the story of Jesus on trial with Pontius Pilate. John chapter 18, verse 33. We're starting at verse 33. Now to set the stage, Pontius Pilate was the fifth Roman governor of Judea at the time Jesus was brought to him. The council of the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders of the day, put Jesus on trial for blasphemy, for claiming he was God, which he is. Yet they found him guilty according to their law, because they didn't believe him. Now, because of Roman law, the Jews could not execute Jesus, which was the just punishment for blasphemy. So they had to obtain Roman permission to do so. In fact, the Romans had to be the ones to perform the execution. Now, the only way they could get them to do that is if the Roman governor agreed with the charge and found him guilty of something worthy of death. Now, let's read from John chapter 18, starting at verse 33. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, 
Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Hey, am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you've done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. Now my kingdom is from another place. So you are a king, then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into this world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? retorted Pilate. Now Pilate has got himself in a little bit of a conundrum. Yep, he's got a problem. In that little bit of an interview he's had with Jesus, he knows he's innocent. But if he frees him, the Jews could possibly revolt and Pilate will have to subdue them by force, an act which could cause much bloodshed and discredit him before Caesar. On the other hand, he knows there's something quite special about Jesus. In the face of death, Jesus is not trying to explain himself. He's not even trying to defend himself. He's not saying anything against his accusers by saying they're wrong. But what I think is blowing Pilate's mind away is that Jesus is not speaking to him as one under his authority, nervous and trembling in his presence, but one who has authority over him. And I think this freaks Pilate right out. He tries to go out and reason with the Jews. Now by him asking Jesus, what is truth? He wasn't concerned with the answer. Because he really wasn't asking a question. I think what he was doing was giving Jesus a piece of his own advice. Basically saying, come on Jesus, say something to defend yourself. Don't you realize the predicament I'm in? Who cares if it's a lie? We all lie when we have to. You see, I believe God opened Pilate's heart to hear the truth. By executing Jesus, Pilate would be without excuse. And besides that, Pilate's wife had sent him a warning to have nothing to do with Jesus, claiming he was innocent, and she'd suffered much in a dream she had because of him. So what is a lie? A lie is either an opposite or a distortion of the truth. Lies cannot exist on their own. They need the truth to be able to oppose or distort. But the job of a lie is always to create deception for the sole purpose of manipulation. There is no agenda behind truth. It is what it is. It may have its consequences. Sometimes it puts you in a worse position by telling the truth. What about the apostles? By saying Jesus was the Messiah and rose from the dead, they put themselves at risk for the rest of their lives. Eventually, except for the apostle John, they were all killed for what they said was true. That is actually hard evidence that the gospel is not just a fairy tale, but true. Because no one lies to make their lives worse. Yeah, sometimes the truth has consequences. Okay, let's go over some key points. Just from John chapter 18, verse 37. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into this world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Now here's some things I want you to take away. Number one, testify to the truth. When it says he came to testify to the truth, what does that tell us? Well, it tells us truth is on trial. This is the courtroom where truth is found guilty. Guilty of what? Guilty of wanting to free and save people from the lies that hold them prisoner. I mean, look at today. Even during this pandemic, there's so many conflicting news stories, it's impossible to know what the heck to believe. And it's the same with religious worldviews. So many spiritual gurus out there will tell you they have the way to spiritual maturity, the way to heaven. Well, there is no way to harmonize it with the statement that Jesus claims to be the way, the truth, and the life. And that no one will get to the Father except through him. You either believe what he says to be the absolute truth, or you don't. But you can't marry his statement with any other worldview or philosophy. Number two. 
Jesus is king. It tells us that he is the highest authority and expert witness of truth. I mean, you can't get a higher and more credentialed witness than truth itself, can you? Number three, the reason he was born. For the king to come in person to testify tells us this is an extremely important trial, one of life and death. And not just his life and death, because Jesus dying on the cross and rising again three days later was all part of his testifying to the truth, but also life and death for us. That's why he came for us, that we may know the truth. It's important for us to seek God and his kingdom, because depending on who we choose to place our hope, we'll have eternal rewards or consequences. Number four, came into this world. That tells us that truth is transcendent. It's not from this world. It existed before the world began. It's eternal, unchangeable. It's not something that comes natural to us. I can attest to that. If someone finds fault with me, my first inkling is to defend myself, to come up with a reason why they're wrong and I'm right. But I've learned the hard way to let those thoughts and feelings go and rightfully examine myself and the situation at hand accept responsibility where I need to, and instead of trying to distort the reality of the predicament to make myself look better. It takes work. Number five, everyone on the side of truth listens. Notice he doesn't limit it to Christian believers, but rather everyone on the side of truth. If you're seeking the truth, you will find it, and you will listen. Number six, Who are we listening to? Listens to me, says Christ. We will listen to the king, for he is truth. The king is always speaking. Now, this doesn't mean we'll know the truth in every given situation, which news story we should believe or who we should vote for. Everything of man has agendas and will not stand the test of time. No, the king is always speaking the truth about who he is and who we are. Knowing who he is helps us to understand everything else because he is the highest standard by which everything is measured and tested. Now, by knowing this gives us a reality check on who we are. You see, the world may know us by our achievements, our mistakes, our faults and insecurities, our sexuality, our abilities or inabilities, our social standing and many other ways. But remember, truth is not from this world. It's from the kingdom of God. And that is the ultimate place of reality. The capital T truth that we are children of the most high king. That is our true identity. It has nothing to do with those other things. Think of going to see a play. There's usually a hero, a villain, a victim, and a whole bunch of random people that have a part in the script. But at the end of the show, they all go back to their families and become who they really are. Wasn't it William Shakespeare that said, all the world is a stage, and all the men and women are merely players? Some actors can get so caught up in a part that they actually believe the person they're playing is really them. Well, Jesus came to teach us who we really are, and to take us home after this melodrama is over. If we'll let him. That is our choice. And I think our choice is based on if we really believe the king. But the reality is we are his children. We are his children. You are his child. And he wants to take you home when this whole thing's over. Number seven. So if truth is on trial, then who is prosecuting it? Lies. Lies are trying to make truth look false and themselves to look like truth. If Jesus is the truth, who is the father of lies? Well, we know that answer, the devil. And if that's the case, what does that tell us? That tells us there's a huge ongoing spiritual battle concerning truth, and especially in the lives of those who wish to stand behind it. It was Winston Churchill who said, truth is so valuable that it's often protected in a bodyguard of lies. What do we see today all around us? Relative truth. What is true for you may not be true for me. Uncertainty in everything. 
identity crisis, not knowing who we really are. Why? What are we afraid of? Are we afraid that our lives may change for the worst? Afraid of losing our friends, family, jobs, positions? You know, we buy self-help books that'll say, follow your heart. Jesus says, follow me. I am the way. I don't want to follow my heart because my heart will lead me away to my own selfish desires. No. Truth sometimes has consequences, but it's one of the most beautiful gifts that God has given us. So important a gift that he came to die for it. It's one of our core free will choices. The question you have to ask yourself today, do you want to be on the side of truth? Do you want to be on the side of truth? If not, ask yourself, what is in the way? What is stopping you? If you want to be on the side of truth, then listen for his voice. And he will speak to you in many different ways. And sometimes he uses trials. Sometimes he uses good things that, that come your way. And sometimes he uses other people, predicaments. But he is always speaking. And he is calling you to have the clouds. Don't turn away. What you have to gain is far better. Way more everlasting. And the shadows that once mocked our separation now blend into the light. 